Uh, well, basically today, uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, two difficulties and a possible solution. As a flyer, as you could read on a flyer, we have two difficulties. One is the market, uh, and the other is the censorship. I mean, the official censorship in Cuba. And for me, at least for me, the nonprofit sector is uh, the best solution for uh, this independent project, the real independent projects in Cuba. I want to start by <clears throat> the market. I mean, this is very easy to recognize. If you travel to Havana right now, you're going to see a lot of like old cars and cigars and whatever, like in every place, and they try to sell you this as art, and what is even worse as Q1 art. But again, for me, this is very easy to recognize. The problem is, when you have projects, uh, I'm not going to mention any name. I'm not, I don't want to be sued. <laughs> but I mean, it's really, uh, it's really annoying to see a project like this. Uh, which is advertised as bringing the best of a Cuban contemporary art into Spain, and then using a name for this project, Cubania, which is, you know, beyond, uh, beyond speakable. Again, I will not stop in the negative part of a market. I think we can talk about that in the questions. I want to I wanna talk more about the censorship uh, in Cuba and the solutions, how the independent projects work. Uh, because unfortunately, as you can read, cigars, this is a, personal, a very personal idea. Cigars, mojitos, and old cars have become the best alive of a Cuban socialism in the 21st century. And they are used as a perfect cover for repeated human rights violation. However, they are only a folkloric tip of a deeper cultural iceberg. I want to start for these two examples. As you all remember, on December 17, 2013, uh, President Obama <clears throat> and General Castro made these announcements uh, that US and Cuba will reestablish diplomatic relationships and so on. The question, the first question was, will the, will the Cuban government be really open to, the, to a real change to reforms Two Cuban artists decided to challenge these political boundaries. Tania Bruguera uh, and Danilo Maldonado, uh, like El Sexto, Aka El Sexto. Their proposals were really uh, annoying for the Cuban authorities. El Sexto described his performance as an homage to Animal Farm, the book of Orwell. He was going to release two pigs named Fidel and Raul in Parque Central, Havana. He was arrested on 2014 Christmas. He was accused of public scandal and disrespect to the leaders of a nation and remained in prison until October 2015. Uh, <clears throat> so it was an aborted performance. Those are some of his drawings in by a grande prison. The other example was Tania Bruguera. Uh, Tania proposed this, let's call it platform, called Yo Tambien Exijo, I Also Demand. Uh, it was like a revival of her 2009 performance, Tatlin Whisper Number no. 6, that she wanted to help this performance in the Plaza, uh, Plaza de la Revolución, Revolution Square in Cuba. Basically, it consists of one microphone, an open microphone to the Cuban people to express their opinions. The problem is, what was tackling whisper number six in, back in 2009 during the 10th edition of the Havana Biennale, and what, what does it mean? You know, Basically, it was an open microphone 
two girls dressed as military and a white doll. As a, as a symbol, a parallelism with the arrival of Castro into Havana on January 8, 1959. In this picture, you see the Cuban dissident, Joanny Sanchez. She was demanding freedom and democracy during her one minute intervention. And this is a picture of Castro with a white doll back in January 8, 1959. It was the first day that he entered Havana and he announced in this speech, he promised freedom and democracy for the people of Cuba. So this performance, Precisely this one was the one that Tania wanted, she proposed it to held it on the Revolution Square in Havana. Of course, she was immediately called to a meeting with a director, no authorization, repudiation of his work. Even, you know, at this point, meeting with art students to push them to repudiate Bruguera's work, that, that was really sad, of course. Finally, <clears throat> she made public her intent to continue with the performance, and she was arrested on December uh, the survey. That happened just less than 15 days, like 10 days after the announcement. <clears throat> it was really symptomatic for everybody. But the problem is, why does it happen? I mean, which are the legal basis for all of this? First of, all, first of all, the Cuban cultural policy is based on the <clears throat> speech to intellectuals. It was a Fidel Castro speech on June 30, uh, 1961. And it, this quote is absolutely, I think, it's very clear. He said that they, within the revolution, everything against the revolution no rights at all. In Spanish, it's more simple. It's con la revolución todo, sin la revolución nada. Then we have the first National Congress of Education and Culture in 1971, and at the end, the Cuban Constitution in 1976. This is, this is a topic for, a, for a, a talk, you know. So, problem is that when you see our Constitution, you will see like, these two articles, which are very precise, artistic creativity is free as long as, it, as its content is not contrary to a revolution. And who says some content is contrary to a revolution? And then citizen, regarding freedom of speech, citizens have freedom of speech and of the press in keeping with the objective of socialist society. In the cultural environment, this work and it's really effective with this institutionalized model for cultural institutions. This is absolutely simplified. You see, everything is controlled by the Ministry of Culture. Then you have the provincial councils, our gallery school, other projects. Everything is under governmental control, and there's an invisible top of this pyramid, which is the Communist Party uh, of Cuba which is like the rector entity of the Cuban society, according to the constitutionals. I don't know, I, I just, in some moment, I tried to make it a little more complex, and I just stopped drawing arrows in some point. So if you can understand it someday, just let me know. This is, this is just an, <laughs> an, an intent to, to do something. This is absolutely crazy. And it's, Oh, yeah, of course. So the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Education, higher up, and then are on the same level, and they're both yeah. directives? Yes. Yeah. They are all in the same level. Yes. Um, Sometimes you can see like competitions or whatever, but they are in the same level. They, they cannot, there's no, in some points, you see the contradiction came here in the art school. When the Ministry of Education, through their <coughs> institutions, want to make some policies and then the Ministry of Culture have another policy. So and they're and conflicting at the end, what I should, if you can, if you use your imagination, and you imagine a little boy or, or girl here, like this, 
So this is, at the end, at the bottom of all of this, the art students are suffering a lot. <clears throat> They're suffering a lot. Anyway, I want to talk about some independent cultural projects in action. Like, first of all, the Cuban official nonprofits and NGOs are nor NGOs, neither nonprofits. There is no legal framework for authentic independent nonprofits. You study constitution right now. However, most part of our independent projects works as nonprofits. Our great challenge, funding, personal contributions, embassies, friends. Promotion is entirely made within, within social media, and volunteering is the best resource we have. We're going to see some examples here, like Espacio Aglutinador. I, I have tried to translate some of, of these names. Of, usually, they make more sense in Spanish. But gathering space is really close to Espacio Aglutinador. It's one of the oldest independent projects in Cuba. It was created by uh, Sandra Ceballos and Ezequiel Suarez in 1994. Uh, I just bring some example of their work. This was a performance called Close Up in 2001. It consisted basically on Sandra and Quintana just in front of a projection of Fidel Castro. They were so close that they cannot see, of course, the whole projection, and they remain like that, you wearing uh, black um, you know, glasses during 30 minutes. Tania Rivera, remember her? Well, she created the Institute of Artivism, Hannah Arendt, in May 2015. Uh, that's the day of our independent declaration of independence or the foundation of a republic or whatever is not accepted officially. The opening performance consisted on a 100 hours reading and discussion of the origins of to totalitarianism. It's a book of uh, Hannah Arendt. The sessions took place at her house more than 50 participants, and it was, I mean, it was just a reading inside the house. And it was, I use this word, surrealistically censored by the government. Uh, the government decided to locate workers who timely began to drill the street in front of her house during the readings. I mean, this is beyond, uh, this is beyond reality. Finally, at the end of this opening performance, she walked out with some friends. She, she was holding, you can see there, like a white pigeon and a book of Hannah Arendt. And of course, she was arrested. You can see the officer dressed with a ministry of the officer and other police. They, they dress as civilian also. She was arrested and taken to her mother's house in a distant neighborhood. That's another detail that is absolutely crazy. It's like, how do you arrest someone and, and take her to, to her mother's house? I mean, Bruguera is, well. Uh, last news, like, honestly, I didn't know anything. I was preparing my presentation, and I knew it on Friday. Uh, she proposed herself as a presidential candidate for the Cuban elections in 2018. That's a joke, and, and it's not a joke. It's part of the Artivism, Artivism Institute. And she says, a, the, the quote, let's start today the civic exercise. Let's start by proposing ourselves as potential candidates to the election. And let's start thinking, what if we actually had that power. Who would we be? What would we do? So this is running right now. I, I have, this, this news from this Friday. So I have, let's see what happened. This is the year that is not correct, yeah? The year. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 2016. That's a mistake. It's 20, uh, 
2016. It was this Friday, 2016. Well, I want to talk about some other projects and exhibitions. Like, again, I'm very sorry. This is a very broad topic. I'm trying to resume to 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 focus in some examples and then to, to in order to have time for the questions and so on. Uh, this is my project. May there always be sunshine. Or, I mean, I'm translating, but. I opened this exhibition the day that the American Embassy was open in, uh, in Havana. I opened this exhibition in my home in Kamaway, and even the name was in Russian. Which was the anthem of the Soviet pioneers. It was kind of revival of, uh, of a Soviet era in Cuba. I used a lot of childhood memories, Soviet curtains, magazines, and toys. It was really annoying for the cultural authorities. It was not censored because I used my home as a, I made a private meeting. So I, I did it with the doors closed and so on. But again, it was, they couldn't break into my home. But it was absolutely banned from every official mention or in the annual meeting of the uh, Council of Visual Arts and, and so on. Uh, oh, you can see some images, like the living room. Every, like, every room of a, of a house had a name. May there always be sunshine. Yeah, the studio, the name was uh, Zniev, which is snow. Um, uh, the bathroom, Alexandra, I think it's a, it's a son, it's a Russian son from a Soviet film called, Mas I don't know the name, Masvani, Masva Lietzam Nieveri, and Tale of Tales in the bedroom, it's a, uh, it's a citation of Yuri Norstein, Skaska Skasok. Uh, really nice animation of 1979. Yeah. Some images. It's another project in the prison of time, December 2015. Uh, part of my last work with a, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a, all the Soviet memories, and so I'm trying to create fake. Uh, memories, and it's really funny. Uh, anima, the first preamble. Uh, anima, like uh, with the accent, and it uh, means like soul. It's a Latin word, anima. Uh, it was curated by Maria de Lourdes and Luis Alberto Marino. Uh, took place during the Creator Scholarship on Ives, and it's an event which is made by the Norway Embassy in Havana. And it was all based on Jose Coser poetry book, Anima. Jose Coser is a Cuban a poet. He's, living, he's been living in the US since he's, he was like 16 or 17 years old, living in Florida. It was a really, really nice project. Uh, you can see some of the works. Uh, Adrián, um, Camila, which a video installation, Juan Pablo with a video, Lester Álvarez. Uh, well, it's a piece of mine in Anima. Finally, the team. This is absolutely independent. It's in a house also. It's an old house in Old Havana. I want to end. I want to end with this exhibition that I personally love. Not because uh, Lester is a great friend, but he's a great artist. The name is uh, "Estado de Silencio," means like state of silence. I don't know if it, that makes sense in English. The double meaning between the state and inner state of silence, or a state that is controlling everything with silence. Uh, he conceived from the conditions in, in which we are living as people, and because most 
of the best and the worst things that we are living are happening in silence. And he structured it in three, like in two parts and one intermezzo. The falling cabinet, the red curtain, and la maleza. Honestly, I don't know how to translate that. The wheat, you can say in English, wheat is like the, the grass or the non-good grass, <laughs> like, uh, but la maleza in Spanish makes, it's like a word play with also with the evil. So it, it, it plays with the grass and also with the evil. So it's absolutely hard to translate. The falling cabinet, he conceived as the act of destruction, the act of destruction as an act of exorcism. Uh, instead of trying to rebuild the ruins, it is better to destroy everything and then try to build something completely new. It was an absolutely fantastic piece of art. Those are stills of a video. This cabinet was filmed and, and then it was projected on the wall. The video was projected on the wall and you could see like the ruins of an actual cabinet on the, on the floor. It was absolutely amazing piece. The red curtain, basically a red and a gray, gray canvas that simulates a red curtain. Remember the iron curtain? This image, according to, to his author, illustrates the lies and the failure in which we live, like a theater. I can't remember the size, but I think it was more than four meters or five meters long and like two or almost three meters, three meters high. And finally, La Maleza, which is basically a collection of wooden books. There are real works and real authors, but they're not published yet. It's a hopeful piece of art, and it reinforces the independent character that needs to have every new proposal in Cuba. It is something to be born and grow up apart from any institution. It grows spontaneous, like wits. A fantastic piece of art, and it's really helpful. You, you could see like the wooden books. You cannot open them, but you could imagine that there was a, a whole universe inside that book. And again, those are real authors and real books, real works that haven't been published yet. Ah, the sea at the end. I mean, this is all. I think I save uh, a little of time for your questions. And are we okay with the time? Yep, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Questions. Yeah. I don't know in Azerbaijan right now, like in Cuba, 
we're still, I think in every Marxist country, there's something that we cannot forget which is called, and it's, uh, it's a Vladimir Lenin invention and it's called Cultural Revolution. It was implemented by Lenin in the USSR, the first years of the USSR. Then it was implemented by Mao Zedong in China. And then in the 60s in Cuba, it was implemented by a lot of intellectuals and also by uh, Che Guevara. It was one of the uh, cultures, one of the of a people that, that most work with this, uh, I mean, it's something that has to do with the Marxist, Leninist theories. So they, they cannot allow freedom of expression. And the artists are conceived as, as if, if an artist is a, a symbol of individuality, should be, of course, opposed to a society or a system which is conceived as, as a symbol of collect, collectivity. So well, isn't that it? It's a, it's a threat to the vision of the human collective? Where, yeah. you know, artists are I mean, we have been uh, expo expelled from many ideal places in this world, <laughs> beginning with Plato, the Greek philosopher, when he he wrote his uh, Politeia uh, Republic. The Republic, uh, he just banned artists from leaving his Republic. <laughs> you know, the Republic is considered the first attempt of communism in the world or something like that. And so, I mean, we are really an annoying people. <laughs> they cannot stand us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, is the uh, I would call like the underground artistic community in Cuba like the um, so these exhibitions and things are held in private homes? Like, how much of the population can that reach, or is it well, obviously the artistic environment or the artistic community in every part of this world is is I wouldn't say a closed environment, but it's, it's not, you know, art or contemporary art or even art, whatever, it's not a popular, uh, it's not a very popular thing. Of, honestly, you're going to see more people in Cuba going to a salsa concert than going to an art exhibition, even though there's a lot of, um, of people, not, not only artists or our students, there are a lot of people that are looking for these projects, looking to participate. I mean, in this, my exhibition in my, my place, it was full of, I, I cannot count how many people, and, and they were, most of them were not artists, not even art students, but I think you cannot measure art for like a, you know, like a, I don't know, the Rolling Stones concert in Havana. I saw them before coming here, by the way. You know, there were like more than 100,000 people in there. You're not going to see that in an exhibition, not even in the, I don't know, maybe you, you can only see that in, you know, the big museums like MoMA or Louvre or whatever. But yeah, we have people, if you mean like non-artist people or participating in these projects and involved and wanted to see it, yeah. Do you think that if the restrictions were lifted and if the freedom of expression was allowed in art, that, um, that the, what art is known for in Cuba would move away from you know, classic cars and, and this sort of uh, commercial art and move towards that the, much of the population would resonate with some of the stuff that you're seeing privately held? Mm. I don't know, I think you will always have this kind of artist that they just want to make money. Uh, you will always have like, you know, in, when you analyze culture, you have like the tip of the iceberg, and then if you want to see the reality of the culture, you, you, you have to go down. So I think 
you're gonna see like a lot of old cars and cigars in Havana, and that's fine. The problem is when you try officially to promote and to sell that as Cuban art. So do you, do you see artists coming together to say this is not Cuban art, is Cuba opens up more, or where do you see the trend going? Do you get more of the submerged part of the artists coming up? Or yeah, what? absolutely, yeah. Because there's a... The market, I mean, I don't want to demonize the market. There is a good aspect of a market, which is, means promotion, also, also with risks. But at the same time that they're going to Cuba, a lot of uh, US galleries, like non-serious galleries, we're also receiving like good art galleries, trying to, and, and they know how to look. So they're looking deep in the iceberg, and they're finding things like this. The risk is, ah, I don't know, it's, money is really comfortable. Even when, you, when you're an art student and you start, I don't know, imagine that you, you, you have like 20 years old and you make video arts with, I don't know, like apples, which talk to each other, just. And there's an art gallery that see the video, uh, the, the gallery, buys you the piece of art and then at the end if you are not quite smart you could be trapped in a in, into, an, the, into a, a net that is going to demand from you more apple videos even when you are 30 40 so at the end you just stop being a real creator so you it's like selling you say in English like s selling the, s you sell your soul to the devil, or, yeah, that's it. That's the risk. You could have independent art, uh, art uh, with a political, meaning more explicit or less explicit, but you could also have independent art which has nothing to do with politics, you know. And even this art is is could be censored. I mean I remember twenty oh five I organized an exhibition. It was semi like half independent. We made a project of a performance in a street within a, a gallery, it was an official gallery. But the other part of this exhibition was not mine, it was uh, another artist, she, she made an exhibition in a church, so I made my, my exhibition in this place. My exhibition has to do with like the notion of, of Eros in the ancient, uh, ancient Greece, and she was talking about the agape, like the love with capital L in the Christian culture, and we connected both exhibitions with a, with a fire, with a flame for the street. It was really nice. At the end, one month later, they fired the, the, the girl that was working with me in the official institution because my exhibition and the performance had something religious inside. So it's like an octopus. You know, censorship has no limits. It's not limited by if you are making or not a political direct uh, statement in your art. Yep. Yep. You mentioned the, the embassies as a source of funding. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? <coughs> how, how does it work exactly and how far can they go? Can, because I mean, yeah. Uh, the Embassy of Norway, that's uh, right now it's our great support. We, we, we joke in Cuba, Tunisia, and we say, I mean, at the end, all the Cuban 
cultural heritage of the last 20 years is going to be in Norway because we owe them everything. Uh, they have an annual funding for cultural projects in Cuba, most of them independent projects. And you just apply, they have like a form, you fill out this form, apply, of course, with a real, with an authentic project. And they decide if, if you are going to, to be founded or not. They organize like exhibitions in their embassy and in the ambassador house. And they also, they have like uh, programs in another cities outside. And it is officially, accepted and at the same time is not accepted. So officially, the Cuban authorities just smile them, oh yes, that's great. But unofficially, if you're going to have an exhibit, if you're going to have an exhibition in an official, in a government gallery, and you are asking for funding of a Norway embassy, then you should ask for a special permission to the one of the elements of that blue net that, I, that you saw in there for the provincial sector or something, you, you need to ask a permission because you're going to have a funding from a, an embassy. I think the Spain, embassy of Spain has helped more, but I, I always say Norway embassy because they are like the great support for independent projects. They have no fear at all. That's it. Absolutely. So. Other questions, what? comments, thoughts? Special. Any, yeah. any final wrapping, concluding thoughts or comments? <sighs> thank you. <laughs> really, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all.